welcome to Keys to the Kingdom. I'm Marissa. Um, sorry for being fashionably late. Um, it's just one of those things. Sometimes you just have to uh, get on uh, get on a different schedule if you want to get it done. So I'm just glad we were able to um, come together today and, and read read the word of the Lord. Um, we're actually going to be doing our um, uh, Bible reading today. And we'll have to finish up with our um, Book of Jubilees reading next Tuesday. But um, God's willing it'll all get done and we'll be able to get into the Word. And that's that's our goal, right? Good morning, Samantha, or afternoon now. <laughs> Good afternoon, Samantha. Welcome. I'm so glad you were able to make it. So today we're going to be continuing our whole Word study in the Book of Genesis. We're in, I'm sorry, in the Book of Exodus. We're in the tail end of Exodus and I actually had to push it back a little bit because um, last Shabbat I was actually on a women's retreat we were doing a, it was actually a, a Rahab women's retreat and it was an all-day thing uh, last Shabbat so I wasn't able to do our whole word study over the weekend and um, so I had to just push it back a little so we'll we'll be finishing up and I, I kind of wanted to spend a little bit more time um, on the reading that we were going to do today only because I wanted to discuss a little bit more than just reading the text. And um, so we're going to finish up the verses that I have allotted for today regarding the priestly garments. And then God's willing this weekend we will do the, the last part of Exodus. And then we'll pick up with the Book of Jubilees next Tuesday, um, if all goes as planned. Okay, so um, let me see here. I want to make sure everybody can hear me. A lot of times I've been having um, a little bit of lag, so just let me know if you can hear me clearly in the comments. I just want to make sure before we get started that I'm not um, choppy. I am going off of, hey Crystal, so glad you could make it, sweetie. I'm going off of my um, playing this during my homeschool class so my girls can listen as well. Oh, <laughs> Tiffany. Okay, um, that's wonderful. I hope they I hope they enjoy what we're going to discuss today. Um, and like I mentioned before, this is going to be the portion of Exodus where we're discussing the priestly garments, and we're going to tie this into um, Ephesians. And we're going to tie it into Yeshua and his priestly role as the high priest who is making intercession for us in the heavenly tabernacle right now as we speak. Um, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to read the sections, the section of Exodus discussing the priestly garments. And then we're just going to expound on that a little bit um, and go into... A little bit of a comparison in the Brit Hadashah, also known as the Newer Testament, and just discuss a few things there. And um, like I said, then hopefully this coming Shabbat we will finish up the book of Exodus, and then maybe next Tuesday we will continue with our book of Jubilee study. Um, like I said, this past Shabbat, I was on a women's retreat, so I wasn't able to do it this past weekend, but um, we're here today, and we will get into the rest of it today. Um, like I said, just let me know that you can hear me clearly. These last few videos, there was some lag in the video, and um, so now I'm hooked up to my... I'm hooked up to my um, personal hotspot, and for some reason, that seems to give me a little bit clearer connection. Um, if for some reason during the video there's some issues with the sound or the video pausing, uh, just let me know in the comments so that I could maybe adjust some things. And um, I, I just want there to be a clear connection as we're reading and going through some things so that, um, so that there's no interruption in the video. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be bringing up the scriptures um, so we can read along together. And we're going to go through 2720 to verse um, to ch chapter 30, verse 10. And then when we're done, we will discuss further 
regarding the priestly garments and how they apply to us and how they sort of apply to Yeshua, our high priest, okay? So let's go ahead and get into it. This is chapter 27 of Exodus, verse 20. All right, so we're going to go ahead and read this first. All right, so let's go ahead and start in um, chapter 27, verse 20. So it says here, Moshe, uh, Moshe is saying, you are to order the people, I'm sorry, this is Yahuwah speaking to Moshe. You are to order the people of Israel to bring you pure oil of pounds, pounded olives for the light. So they were supposed to use olive oil for the lighting of the menorah. For the light and to keep a lamp burning continually. So there was supposed to be a constant burning menorah light in the tabernacle. Aaron and his sons are to put it in the tent of meeting outside the curtain in front of the testimony and keep it burning from evening until morning before Yahuwah. This is to be a permanent regulation through all the generations of the people of Israel. So in the tabernacle and in the temple, once the temple was built, there was supposed to be a light burning continuously from evening until morning before Yahuwah. Okay. You are to summon your brother Aaron and his sons to come from among the people of Israel to you so that they can serve me as Kohanim or priests. Aaron and his sons, Nadav, Avihu, Eleazar, and Itamar. You are to make for your brother Aaron garments set apart for serving God expressing dignity and splendor. Speak to all the craftsmen to whom I have given the spirit of wisdom and have them make Aaron's garments to set him apart for me so that he can serve me in the office of Kohen or priest. The garments are to make, the garments they are to make are these, a breastplate, a ritual vest, a robe, a checkered tunic, a turban and a sash and they are to make holy garments for your brother Aaron and his sons so that he can serve me in the office of Kohen they are to be used they are to use gold blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen so the priestly garments were made of linen um, and there was also gold involved as well they are to make the ritual vest of gold of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and of finely woven linen, crafted by a skilled artisan. Attached on its front and back edges are to be two shoulder pieces that can be fastened together. Its decorated belt is to be of the same workmanship and materials, gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely woven linen. Take two onyx stones and engrave them on the on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of their names on the stone, on one stone, and six remaining names on the other, in order of their birth. So basically, in order of their birth, you were to have these onyx stones with six of the tribes on one stone and six of the tribes on the other stone, and they were to be on stones that were placed on the shoulders of the high priest, okay? in order of their birth. An engraver should engrave the names of the sons of Israel on the two stones as he would engrave a seal. Mount the stones in gold settings and put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the vest as stones calling to mind the sons of Israel. Aaron is to carry their names before Yahuwah on his two shoulders as a reminder. Make gold squares and two chains of pure gold, twisted like cords, attach the cord-like chains to the squares. Make a breastplate for judging, 
Have it crafted by a skilled artisan. Make it like the work of a ritual vest. Make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely woven linen. When the folded, when folded double, it is to be square. A hand span by a hand span. Put it in settings of stones, four rows of stones. The first row is to be, okay, so basically here is the breastplate, okay? So we're speaking of the breastplate now. The breastplate for judging, okay? And on its settings of stones, there's to be four rows of stones. And the first row is to be carnelian, a topaz, and an emerald. So you had three, 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 and three. The second row is a green feldspar, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row is an orange zircon, an agite, and an amethyst. And the fourth row is beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They are to be mounted in their gold settings. The stones will correspond to the names of the 12 sons of Israel. They are to be engraved with their names as a seal would be engraved to represent the 12 tribes, okay? So first you had two onyx stones on the shoulders of Aaron, the high priest, and then you had the breastplate, which had 12 onyx stones with the engraving of the 12 tribes of Israel, the names of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So you had, you had three stones, three stones, three stones, and three stones. So four rows of three stones, each with a different stone, representing a different tribe of Israel, okay? On the breastplate, make two pure gold chains twisted like cords. Also for the breastplate, make two gold rings and put the gold rings on the two ends of the breastplate. Put the two twisted gold chains in the two rings at the two ends of the breastplate. Attach the other ends, I'm sorry, attach the two other ends of the twisted chains to the front of the shoulder pieces of the ritual vest. Make two gold rings and put them in the two ends of the breastplate at its edge on the side facing towards the vest. Also make two gold rings and attach them low on the front part of the vest's shoulder pieces near the join above the vest decorated belt. Then bind the breastplate by its rings to the rings of the vest with a blue cord so that it can be on the vest decorated belt and so that the breastplate won't swing loose from the vest. So basically it was supposed to be attached to his vest. Aaron will carry the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate for judging over his heart when he enters the holy place as a continual reminder before Yahuwah. You are to put the Urim and the Tumim on the breastplate for judging, in the breastplate for judging. They will be over Aaron's heart when he goes into the presence of Yahuwah. Thus Aaron will always have the means for making decisions for the people of Israel over his heart when he is in the presence of Yahuwah. And just as a side note, you know they always, you know they, they used often the Urim and the Tumim to make decisions to make decisions and to find out the will of the Lord. So they would, one of them would represent a negative answer and one of them would represent a positive answer. And that would determine whether Yahuwah was saying yes to a matter or no to a matter. Okay, and Aaron was keeping these close to his heart, okay? so that he would always have the means for making decisions for the people of Israel. You are to make the robe for the ritual vest entirely of blue. It is to have an opening for the head in the middle. Around the opening is to be a border woven like the neck of a coat of mail so that it won't tear. On its bottom hem, make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet and put them all the way around with gold bells between them all the way around. Gold bell pomegranate, gold bell pomegranate all the way around the hem of the robe. So on the bottom of the robe, there was a gold bell and a pomegranate, a gold bell and a pomegranate going all the way around the hem of the robe. 
Aaron is to wear it when he ministers, and its sound will be heard whenever he enters the holy place before Yahuwah, and when he leaves, so that he won't die. So basically, there were these pomegranates and bells on the very bottom hem of Aaron's garment, so that when he entered into the holy place, he it's almost like he was announcing his presence, and then when he would leave the holy place, it would announce that he was departing the holy place. And it says here, it was so he wouldn't die. Um, almost as if, you know, before you're, you're going before a king, you are, you are announcing your presence, and then you are dismissing your presence. Um, in this way, obviously Aaron was going before the king of kings in the holy place, and these um, were to make a noise as he was walking in and out of the holy place. You are to make an ornament of pure gold and engrave it on a seal set apart for Yahuwah. Fasten it to the turban with a blue cord on the front of the turban over Aaron's forehead. Okay, so look, check this out. You're to make an ornament of pure gold and engrave on it as a seal set apart for Yahuwah. So there was to be a gold plate on the forehead of Aaron that said set apart for Yahuwah. Okay? And it was attached to the turban with blue cords. And this was over Aaron's forehead. Because Aaron bears the guilt for any errors committed by the people of Israel in consecrating their holy gifts. This ornament is always to be on his forehead so that the gifts for Yahuwah will be accepted by him. You are to weave the checkered tunic of fine linen, make a turban of fine linen, linen, and make a belt the work of a weaver in colors. Likewise, for Aaron's sons, make tunics, sashes, and headgear expressing dignity and splendor. With them, clothe your brother Aaron and his sons, then anoint them, inaugurate them, and consecrate them, so they will be able to serve me in the office of Cohen. Also make for them linen shorts reaching from waist to thigh to cover their bare flesh. So um, this is almost like having underwear. Linen shorts from their waist to their thigh is, is, basically, like having, um, is basically having underwear. Aaron and his sons are to wear them when they go into the tent of meaning and when they approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they won't incur guilt and die. This is to be a perpetual regulation both for him and his descendants. Okay, chapter 29. Here is what are... Here is what you are to do to consecrate them for ministry to me in the office of Kohen. Take one young bull and two rams without defect. Also matzah, matzah cakes mixed with fine olive oil and matzah wafers spread with oil. All made from fine wheat flour, put them together in a basket and present them in the basket along with the bulls and the two rams. Bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Okay, so before they were to enter, they were to be washed with water. Okay, and they were to bring sacrifice and they were also to bring matzah, which is unleavened bread. Wash them with water. Take the garments and put on Aaron the tunic, the robe for the ritual vest, the vest itself, and the breastplate. Fasten the vest on him with its belt. Put the turban on his head and attach the holy ornament to the turban, which was the gold plate. Then take the anointing oil and anoint him by pouring it on his head, okay? Bring his sons, put tunics on them, and wrap sashes around them. Aaron and his sons, and put the headgear on their heads. The office of Cohen is to be theirs by a permanent regulation. Thus you will consecrate Aaron and his sons. Bring the young bull in front of the tent of meeting. Aaron and his sons are to lay their hands on the bull, and you are to slaughter the bull in the presence of Yahuwah at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So at the entrance is where you made the sacrifice. 
Take some of the bull's blood and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger. Pour out all the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. Take all the fat that covers the inner organs, the covering of the liver, and the two kidneys with their fat and offer them up in smoke on the altar. But the bull's flesh, skin, and dung are to be destroyed by fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. Take one of the rams. Aaron and his sons are to lay their hands on the ram's head. And you are to slaughter the ram, take its blood, and splash it on all sides of the altar. Quarter the ram, wash the inner organs and the lower parts of the legs, and put them with the quarters and the head. Then offer the whole ram in smoke on the altar. It is a burnt offering for Yahuwah, a pleasing aroma, an offer made to Yahuwah by fire. Take the other ram. Aaron and his sons are to lay their hands on the ram's head. You are to slaughter the ram, take some of its blood, put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, on the lobes of his sons' right ears, on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the big toes of their right feet. Take the rest of the blood. I mean, let's just let's just face it. This is this is this is sort of interesting what he's doing here that they're taking the second ram and they're putting some of the blood on the lobe on the right ear lobe of Aaron and his sons. Okay? On the right thumb and on the big toes of their right feet. They're putting some of the blood of the second ram. Take the rest of the, blo the blood and splash it on all sides of the altar. Then take some of the blood that's on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his clothing and on his sons and the clothing of his sons with him so that he and his clothing will be consecrated and with him his sons and his sons' clothing. Also take the fat from the ram, the fat tail, the fat that covers the inner organs, the two kidneys, the fat covering them and the right thigh, for it is a ram of consecration, along with one loaf of bread, one cake of oiled bread, and one wafer from the basket of matzah. So now we have a loaf of bread and a wafer of the basket of matzah, which is before Yahuwah. And put it in all the hands of Aaron's sons. They are to wave them as a wave offering in the presence of Yahuwah. Then take them back and burn them up in smoke on the altar, on top of the burnt offering to be a pleasing aroma before Yahuwah. It is an offering made by Yahuwah by fire. Take the breast of the ram for Aaron's consecration and wave it as a wave offering before Yahuwah. It will be your share. Consecrate the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of any contribution that has been waved and raised up, whether from the ram of consecration or from anything else meant for Aaron and his sons. This will belong to Aaron and his sons as their share perpetually due from the people of Israel. It will be a contribution from the people of Israel from their peace offerings, their contribution to Yahuwah. The holy garments of Aaron will be used by his sons after him. They will be anointed and consecrated in them. The son who becomes Kohen in his place, who comes into the tent of meeting to serve in the holy place, is to wear them for seven days. Take the ram of consecration and boil its meat in the holy place. So they were supposed to take this ram of consecration and boil its meat in the holy place. Aaron and his sons will eat the ram's meat and the bread in the basket at the entrance to the tent of meeting. They are to eat the things with which atonement was made for them. To inaugurate and consecrate them, no one else may eat this food because it is holy. So only Aaron and his sons were to eat the sacrifices that were offered from the, from the children of Israel. Only Aaron and his sons because they were holy. If any of the meat for the consecration or any of the bread remains until morning, burn up what remains it is not to be eaten because it is holy you know and i've mentioned um i've i've mentioned i'm just going to pause here for a second but i've mentioned in previous videos these these instances where there was only certain people who were supposed to 
to to do certain things because certain things were holy and a lot of it has to do with the fact that Aaron and his sons went through a process that made them that consecrated them to be able to serve in this manner and that's why they didn't die but if anybody else who had not been consecrated in the exact formula that Aaron and his sons were and they were to consume any of this holy meat or to go into the holy of holies they would die and like I've mentioned before a lot of this had to do with the fact that the frequency of Yahuwah is at such a high level that and anything that his presence touched was made holy and if anyone was to consume or I mean and obviously the text says it they would die because we're not holy he's giving them a formula so that they can go before him so that they don't die um, and that's why a lot of the times we say you know why can't why can't we just see God why can't we just be in the presence of God you know we are in a process over time of God making us bringing us to a righteous standing obviously through his son Yeshua and sanctifying us so that we can get to a place so that the new Jerusalem can come down we're just not ready for that yet because we you know after the fall you know literally this this fall of man our 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 literal humanly frequency was lowered to such an extent that we could not we could no longer have the sort of communion that we once had and this is this whole this whole biblical love story is him tr is Yahuwah trying to to bring about this restoration of heaven and earth okay so nobody else could eat it because it was holy okay and you are to spend seven days consecrating them um, each day offer a young bull as a sin offering besides the other offerings of atonement offer the sin offering on the altar as your atonement for it then anoint it to consecrate it seven days you will make atonement on the altar and consecrate it thus the altar will be especially holy and whatever touches the altar will become holy amen crystal today is the last day of matzah i'm so glad you pointed that out today is the last day of matzah this is actually supposed to be a holy convocation uh, i'm so glad that you mentioned that um because as i mentioned before in in the previous video we started celebrating pesach last tuesday evening and so today is actually the last day of matzah and uh i'm so glad that crystal is celebrating it um during this time of year and I'm so excited for you, Crystal, that this is actually your first year celebrating Pesach, and this is the first year that we're celebrating it, adding a month um, on this new calendar that um, we have felt led to to follow because of, of, of all the reconciling of the instructions of how we're supposed to calculate the days the months the years and the feast days so for us maybe not for you if you're not on this this calendar that we're celebrating it on but we are celebrating this day as the last day of matzah so I'm glad you brought that up sweetie okay so let's continue reading here it says um to make atonement on the altar and consecrate it whatever touches the altar will become holy so again we see here that it's saying it will become holy okay there is there is this process of making things holy and the spirit of the lord you know coming upon the altar you know it's consuming the sacrifices and the, the the whole process the whole process of this 
is a very, very holy, sacred thing in such a way that when you have the manifest presence of the Lord coming into the Holy of Holies, everything in the surrounding area is made holy because of the presence of the Lord. Because literally, the frequency of Yahuwah is so high. He, he is... He is spirit, you know, Yahuwah is spirit, and his spirit is is vibrating at such at, at the highest frequency. Just think of it as the highest frequency, and we do not. We operate at a much lower frequency because we are still in a fallen state, and we still have a sinful nature. You know, so if you were to touch any of these things or consume any of these things, you're talking about combining something that is so astronomically higher on a frequency level than is our own being. Now this is what you are to offer on the altar. Two lambs a year old regularly every day. So this was the daily offering, okay? Two lambs, uh, two lambs a year old regularly every day. One lamb you are to offer in the morning and the other lamb at dusk. So this was the daily offering that was to be offered. With one lamb offered two quarts of finely ground flour mixed with one quart of oil from pressed olives along with one quart of wine as a drink offering, okay? The other lamb you're to offer at dusk. Do with it as with the morning grain and drink offerings. It will be a pleasing aroma, an offering made to Yahuwah by fire. So we see here that daily the sacrifice was to be a lamb, fine flour mixed with a quart of olive oil, and one quart of wine as a drink offering. So we were actually offering, as part of the offerings to Yahuwah, wine. And this was to be the same for the evening offering as well. Through all your generations, this is to be the regular burnt offering at the entrance of the tent of meeting before Yahuwah. There is where I will meet with you and speak with you. There I will meet with the people of Israel. And the place will be consecrated by my glory. Okay, this is very important, okay? This is very important right here. Actually... All of this, but I want I want to I want you to pay close attention to this. There is where I will meet and speak with you. There I will meet the people of Israel, and the place will be consecrated by my glory. So this is what I'm trying to convey to you because oftentimes we read these parts and we say it's holy, it's consecrated. Um, you know, nobody else can do this because otherwise they would die. But look what it's saying. The place will be consecrated by my glory, the glory of the Lord. Like I, And I'm going to do a whole series on this pretty soon. I'm, I'm, I'm working very hard on it, and I'm trying to get it all together because I want it to be right, and I don't want to rush it. But it's going to be on the frequency of Yahuwah and tending to our tabernacle and how the frequency of Yahuwah is so... It's, it's the highest level of, of in, you can call it energy, you can call it frequency, you can call it light. These words have meanings, but there is, there is a frequency to Yahuwah, and there is a, there's a frequency to everything. We know that, you know, not all science is bad, but we know that science has proven that everything has energy. Even something that seems to be solid is actually vibrating, but it's at vibrating at a much lower, lower, lower level, and it just seems to be solid, but nothing is actually solid. Everything is vibrating. Everything has energy. We know this. We know this from science. With that knowledge, we know that Yahuwah is saying that he will be consecrating it by his glory, okay? And this is making everything around it holy, okay? Just like when, remember when Moshe went upon the mountain and he went up to Yahuwah, when he came down, what was happening? His face was radiating light, okay? Was radiating this light, why? Because he had been 
literally in the presence speaking with Yahuwah. And his face was radiating this, what is it? This light, okay? And light has frequency. And after he had come down off of the mountain, what started to happen? That light started to fade. It started to kind of go away because it wasn't permanent, because he wasn't permanently staying in the presence of Yahuwah, okay? So I, I, want to, I want you to keep this in your mind when you see things like this, you know, that this is holy. What does that mean that it's holy? What does it mean that you cannot touch the mountain because it's holy? It means that the frequency of Yahuwah has manifest and come down. And it's so holy that if you touch it, you will die because your being does not op. It, it's like you touching electricity or putting your finger in a socket in a power socket what's going to happen that frequency is going to go into your body okay and it's going to go through your it's going to electrocute through your it's going to radiate through your entire body and because you do not operate you know you do not vibrate at the same level as this frequency you could die okay it's the same thing here with Yahuwah. Remember, in his presence, we all always see what? We see thunder, lightning, and so there's lightning in his presence. Um, just bear in mind when you see these things and why there was strict regulations when you were coming into his presence. There was things that you had, that, that the priests had to do, and even the people of Israel had to consecrate themselves. There was there was washing that had to be done. You had to make yourself clean before you could go before the Lord. Okay, so just keep that in mind when you read these, these parts of Exodus. <clears throat> okay, so, and the place will be consecrated by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Likewise, I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me in the office of Cohen. Then I will live with the people of Israel and be their God. And they will know that I am Yahuwah their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt in order to live with them. I am Yahuwah their God. Okay, and just the last part here, guys, in chapter 30. You are to make an altar on which to burn incense. Make it of acacia wood. It is to be 18 inches square and three feet high. Its horns are to be of one piece with it. Overlay it with pure gold, its top and all around its sides and its horns, and put around it a molding of gold. Make two gold rings for under its molding at the two corners on both sides. This is where the carrying poles will go. Make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Everything was overlaid with gold, okay? And um, believe it or not, gold is a, is, a, um, is a pretty good conductor of electrical, um, well, let's see here. Let me just, let me just look something up for you really quick. I should have had this prepared, but Bear with me one second. Yeah, so gold is also a conductor of electricity, and it's also a conductor of heat as well. It's actually highly conductive, meaning that electricity can easily flow through it with minimal resistance. Copper, silver, and, and aluminum are also conductive, but gold offers a superior, superior level of electrical conductivity. As a result, it is a perfect material for electrical components. Okay, so gold is the most superior metal when it comes to conducting electricity or heat because it can flow the easiest with minimal resistance okay so this is why everything was overlaid with gold 
place in front of the curtain by the ark for the testimony in front of the ark cover I'm sorry place it in front of the curtain by the ark okay so what are we talking about the altar of burning incense was to be in front of the curtain by the ark of testimony in front of the ark cover that is over the testimony where I will meet with you so this incense was to be burning in the Holy of Holies. Aaron will burn fragrant incense on it as a pleasing aroma every morning. He is to burn it when he prepares the lamps. Aaron is to burn it when he lights the lamps at dusk. This is the regular burning of incense before Yahuwah throughout all your generations. You are not to offer an authorized incense on it or a burning offering or a burnt offering or a grain offering. You are not to pour a drink offering on it. Aaron is to make atonement on its horns once a year. With the blood of the sin offering of atonement, he is to make atonement for it once a year through all your generations. It is especially holy to Yahuwah. Okay? So we see here all of these things that are supposed to be in the tent of meeting, some of which are in the Holy of Holies, some are outside of the curtain. Okay, so you have the ark, you have the lamp, you have the menorah, you have the table of showbread where the bread was, you have the altar of incense, okay? And then outside you have this laver of water where you were to wash. Um, and then you have the altar, obviously, where you're offering up your burnt sacrifices. All of these things you see followed by cons words like consecrated and holy, okay? And just bear in mind that is because of the presence of Yahuwah's glory, okay? So now I want to take the I just want to focus on the garments of Aaron okay so I want us to look at um, I want us to look at something regarding the garments of Aaron okay and how you know obviously Aaron was the high priest okay you had the Levites you had other um, priests serving in the tabernacle and you know later on in the temple uh, but you had one high priest, okay? And 15 times in the Brit Hadashah, or the Newer Testament, in Hebrew it's the Brit Hadashah, 15 times we see that Yeshua, or Yahusha, is called our high priest. 15 times, okay? And I just want to go through um, briefly over some of the um, priestly garments and how they are referred to in Ephesians okay so let's go ahead and look at this alright so we see Yahushua is called the high priest 15 times in the Brihada Shah or the New Testament and basically so here's a picture here of what the high priest's garments would have looked like okay so here we have, um, so you were to make a pure gold engraving. So this was the gold plate that was over the forehead of Aaron, okay? And engraved on it was to be set apart for Yahuwah, okay? And this was fastened to his turban by these blue, by this blue thread here. This blue cord was to attach this gold plate to the forehead of Aaron, okay? All right, and then we also had these onyx stones that were engraved on both of these shoulder pads here, these onyx stones with six of the sons of Israel and then the other six sons of Israel um, on the other stone, okay? And these were on the shoulders of Aaron. And then obviously here we have the breastplate, okay? So we had four rows of threes, each with different stones, and each one of these represented one of the tribes of Israel. 
And then the Urim and the Tuvim was going to be behind here around the heart of Aaron. That's where you had the Urim and the Tuvim. Okay. And then the ephod of gold and blue and purple and scarlet yarn, okay, as part of his ritual vest. And then down here, these were the um, these were the pomegranates and the bells around the very bottom hem of his garment, okay. So you had gold bells. You would have a gold bell and then a pomegranate, a gold bell and a pomegranate, and these were to make a noise as he was entering to the tabernacle, and these were to make a noise as he was exiting as well. And then down at the very, very bottom, we see that he was always barefoot. So here in Ephesians, okay, Ephesians 6, we typically see the armor of God as being a Roman soldier. How many of you were taught that the armor of God was a Roman soldier? Anybody? Was anybody taught that it was a Roman soldier? The armor of God, putting on the armor of God and it was likened to a Roman soldier. How many of you were taught that? Okay, I just want to sort of make a little bit of an argument here or a comparison more as to being the garments of the high priest, not a Roman soldier, okay? And we're going to go through and see how Paul was actually talking about the garments of a high priest, not the armor of a Roman soldier, okay? This was Hebraic, it was not Roman. So let's just go ahead and read Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, and it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness and in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, so we have girded your waist with truth, breastplate of righteousness, showed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace and above all, take on the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take on the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, with all preservation, uh, prev um, I'm sorry, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly and to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am the ambassador in chains, that is, that is, that is it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Okay, hold on one second for me, guys. Okay guys, I'm so sorry. My um, 
my dog was my dog was wanting out of the room. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue here. So this is what we see in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 regarding the armor of God that we're supposed to be putting on, right? And typically we have seen this to be a Roman soldier, but why would Paul want us to put on the Roman soldier's armor? One of the most common misunderstandings regarding the armor of God is unduly caused by Greek and Roman cultural views. Many commentaries compared the whole armor of God with the armor of Roman soldiers. But the problem is this, Paul was not referring to the Roman armor at all. He was actually making reference to an ancient Hebraic armor, a heavenly armor. Paul did not come up with the idea of the full armor of God on his own. He drew his wisdom and understanding from the Old Testament. So let's take a look at Isaiah 53 here. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, okay, so we see here righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Okay. Also in Isaiah 11 it says, But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with iniquity for the meek on the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. And in Exodus 28, 1 through 4, it says, Now take Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Ilamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty, just like we read earlier. And you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, and that he may minister to me as a priest. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillful woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. So they shall make holy garments, for Aaron your brother and his sons, that he may minister to me as a priest. So obviously Paul was making reference to the holy garments of the priesthood called by God, not the armor of unholy, violent, and merciless Roman soldiers thirsty to torture others and kill people. Okay, just like we were reading um, before, these were especially made, um, these were especially made garments that Aaron and his sons were to wear in the service to Yahuwah. Okay? So when Paul is speaking about us putting on the armor of God, why on earth would he be talking about Roman armor, which was designed to protect them in warfare? Well, hold on, let's continue. Okay, so it says here, in 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. How is the priesthood dressed? And how is the high priest dressed? Well, let's take a look. How about the belt of truth? In Leviticus 8, 6 through 7, it says, Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. He put on the tunic, girded him with the sash, clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod on him. 
and he girded him with the intricately woven band of the ephod, and with it he tied the ephod to him. In John 17, 17, it says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So this belt of truth holds the priestly garments together. Without it, all the other portions would fall apart. The Lord desires to wash his priests with water and sanctify them by his truth, so that they will not be led astray to embrace false gods and worship idols. How about this breastplate of righteousness? In Exodus 2, I'm sorry, in Exodus 28, 4, it says, These are the priestly garments which they shall make. A breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. And he shall make holy garments for Aaron and your brothers and his sons, that he may minister to me as priests. Exodus 28, 15, You shall make the breast, breastplate of judgment. Okay? That's, that's this breastplate breastplate of righteousness you are to make the breastplate of judgment artists artists artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod you shall make it of gold blue purple and scarlet thread a finely woven linen you shall make it exodus 28 22 through 30 you shall make chains for the breastplate you shall make two rings for the breastplate okay we just read this in in exodus 28 regarding how to make the breastplate, okay? But as we come down here, it says, So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. In Leviticus 19.15, we see it says, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. The priests are to be righteous before God. They cannot play favoritism towards the rich and despise the poor. They have to pray for every tribe in the community regardless of their financial status, not one less. A high priest is not to have a holier-than-thou attitude towards others. He ministers to everyone and bears their names and burdens over his heart. There is no discrimination or bias against anyone. Let's look at Yeshua, our high priest. In Matthew 4, 23-24, it says, And Yeshua went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all all kinds of diseases among the people. Then his fame went through all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed and epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. What is righteousness in the sight of God? Well, Deuteronomy 6.25 says, okay, then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he commanded us. Luke 1, 5 through 6 says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But a Roman soldier does not have any righteousness on his breastplate. Neither does he desire to keep the commandments of God. What about showed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace? What about showing your feet? Okay. In Exodus 28, as we just read earlier, it says, okay, that he was to have these pomegranates and bells all around the hem of the robe, okay? And he shall wear it when he ministers so that its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out so that he may not die. In Exodus 3, 5, it says, And he said, Do not draw near this holy place. Take your sandals off your feet. 
for the place where you stand is holy ground. <coughs> so he was supposed to take his sandals off. Okay, so showed your feet, showing your feet in preparation of the gospel, right? Of peace, right? So priests minister to God without wearing any shoes or sandals. They walk barefoot on the floor in the temple courts. However, they are always ready to bring good news and proclaim peace. Bring glad tidings of good things and proclaim salvation. A Roman soldier wears shoes but brings bad news and proclaims war. Isaiah 52 7 says how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news who proclaims peace and who brings glad tidings who proclaims salvation who says to Zion your God reigns how about the shield of faith in Genesis 15 1 we see after these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. In Psalm 3, 1 through 3, it says, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. How does God shield his people? The best picture is from Exodus out of Egypt. Exodus 13, 21 through 22 says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. And in Exodus 14, 19 through 20, it says, He would camp before the children of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So all around about them. So it came between the camp and the Egyptians. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that one did not come near the other all night. When God shields us, it is complete divine full protection on all sides, top and bottom, 360 degrees all around about. But the Roman shield is just human partial protective and full of vulnerable attacks. Let's look at the helmet of salvation. What does it say in Exodus 28:36? You shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the graving of a signet holiness of I'm sorry. It says holiness to the Lord, but it says set apart for Yahuwah in the Hebrew. But this is the helmet of salvation. The gold plate that we discussed in Exodus 28 that was engraved, set apart for Yahuwah, or this translation says holiness to the Lord. And, you shall, and it shall be on Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which, are the, which the children of Israel hallow in all their gifts. And it shall always be on his forehead that he may be accepted before the Lord. Holiness to the Lord, set apart for Yahuwah. Yahuwah himself will separate the holy ones from the unholy. His name shall be on the foreheads of the righteous saints. Where do we see this? In Revelation 24, it says, I saw the thrones and they, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Yeshua and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And in Revelation 22, 4, we see it says, They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. How about the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, as part of the armor? What is the sword? In Isaiah 49, 2, it says, And he made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand, and he has hidden me. And he made me a polished shaft, and in his quiver he has hidden me. Isaiah 11, 4 says, But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with iniquity for the meek of the earth. 
he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. Where else do we see this? In Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Which one is that? The word of God. Piercing even the division of the soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Revelation 1.16 says, He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Not a physical Roman sword of violence and killing and destroying others, but a sharp two-edged two -edged sword out of the mouth proclaiming the word of God. Very often, it is the reciting the priestly blessing to bless others. Okay, I'm just going to skip down here to this part where it says, Praying with all prayer and supplication. Most Roman soldiers don't spend any time on prayers for themselves and almost never pray for the cause of the poor and the needy. Only the priests who were called to pray and make intercession for God on behalf of others. In Exodus 34, 8 through 9, it says, So Moses made haste and bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us. One good example of wearing a wrong armor is David when he fought against Goliath. Don't you remember when David was fighting against Goliath that Saul asked him to put on his armor. In 1 Samuel 17, it says, So Saul clothed David with his armor. Okay? This is with Saul's armor now. And he put a bronze helmet on his head, and he made him clothed him with a cloak of mail. And David fastened his sword with his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I had not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five, five smooth stones from the brook. Okay, and we know he put it into his bag, and he came to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. Okay, so he goes before Goliath, and he says, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts of Israel. Okay, then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give it into your hands did David I'm sorry David didn't use the armor of Saul he came in the name of the Lord of hosts and the battle is the Lord's and he will fight for us and give us victory we only need to stand still and see his salvation So in Ephesians 6, it says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So we don't need this Roman armor. We have to put on the holy priestly garments. And this is how the royal priesthood does spiritual warfare. In 2 Chronicles 20, we see... We see this going on. We see that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, and a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. He said, Listen, all you of Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid or dismayed because of the great multitude, for the battle is not yours, 
but God's. Tomorrow you go down to, against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness, and you will not need to fight this battle. Position yourselves and stand and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Okay? So the Levites stood up and praised the Lord of God of Israel with voices loud and high. Okay? And when he has consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness. As they went out before the army, they were saying, Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now, when they began to sing and to praise, this is what they were doing as they were going out to war. They were singing praises to the Lord. Not by fruitless screaming, roaring, barking, and yelling, but with the high praises of God in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. They just praised the Lord, and the Lord set ambushes to destroy their enemies, and not one escaped. Psalm 149, 5 through 9 says, Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud in their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and a two-edged sword in their hands, to execute vengeance on the nations and to punish on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. So there is this misconception in Ephesians that the whole armor of God is a Roman soldier's armor. But how could the Roman soldier's armor possibly be what Yahuwah would want us wearing if we are a royal priesthood in the New Jerusalem? Um, obviously, Paul, Shaul, was speaking about the priestly garments like Aaron used to wear. Okay? very very different from the roman soldiers armor that we have so often heard likened to the armor of god that paul is telling us to put on in the book of ephesians one more thing i want to point out before we go um that i just i just always think of I always think of Yeshua when I read about this part of the priestly garments. Okay? There's this there's this command in the giving of the priestly garments that says that there were to be two onyx stones that were to be placed on either shoulder of Aaron. And one had six of the tribes of Israel and the other had the other six of the tribes of Israel. And these, I'm going to show you here, these were the... Um, were to be set in gold, okay, so two onyx stones, each with six of the tribes of Israel. And I just want to show you this here um, before you go, because this is, this is something that I've always, more than any of the priestly garments, I always think of Yeshua when I, um, when I read this part of, of the garments being given, okay. So these were the ephods, These were the stones that were to be on the shoulders of the high priest, each containing um, six of the tribes of Israel and one with the other six of the tribes of Israel, okay? But this is how we see Yeshua fulfilling that the government shall rest on his shoulders. We always read that the government would rest on the shoulders of the Mashiach, of the Messiah. What is this government that's on his shoulders? What is this government that is on the shoulders 
of our high priest? It's Israel. He has Israel on his shoulders. And for some reason, I always think of him carrying Israel on his shoulders. Carrying the children of Israel on his shoulders. Almost like a father would put his son or daughter on his shoulders and carry him on his shoulders. I always think of a father carrying his son or daughter on his shoulders, but it also means he's carrying the government. And the government of the kingdom is Israel. And this was on the shoulders of the high priest. And it is also on the shoulders of our high priest today, Yahusha, in the heavenly tabernacle that is in heaven right now making intercession for us. I just thought that was a beautiful depiction of um, how Yahusha carries the government on his shoulders, how he carries each of us on his shoulders, 